All right, so <clears throat> since uh, we have about 30 minutes question answers, <clears throat> and since we will have some more questions tomorrow, uh, it's maybe better to ask you questions on the subject tonight rather than what we've been doing uh, during the week as, so we can take advantage of Pastor Mike <clears throat> and Pastor Phil being here also. Uh, <clears throat> so what I would like to do, because it's still, you know, er everybody's invited, of course, but it's, since it's a master's class, we have some students out here for credits. If you have some questions and you're a credit student, you have priority for the questions. So it's easy for you to know who they are. They are in the f first three rows. So if, well, if nobody has a question and I know it's, person who wants to do that, he, they are free to answer the questions, but I would have to have the students have priority. So you have a microphone, and you have a microphone. Thank you. Can maybe check the microphone. Do I need, yes, I need to, to do that. I'm going to run around. So who has a question? I can a, have a, a comment. Yes. I'm doing your work, Mr. Simon. Did you Finally. see that? Finally. I have uh, 62 questions. Uh, number one. No. Uh, my, the most interesting thing to me that you said was about um, the dating process being so flawed. It seems to me that the two primary reasons that it's wrong is that we don't know what we're starting with. I mean, this is my words. We don't know what we're starting with, and there could be an accelerated uh, de decay rate or diffusion rate. or uh, That's... Primarily, it seemed like those are the two reasons why it's, it seems like it's way off. Could you talk a little bit more about that? And, and is there anything specific that could accelerate things like Shekinah glory or a flood? Like in that way, could it also accelerate things? It's working. I don't know if this is, oh, now it's working. Um, yeah, it, it would. Uh, water is, it makes a major impact. And so anything that would have died in the flood, uh, boy, that would have wreaked havoc, um, obvious. But <laughs> salt, I'm not so sure about salt. Uh, I know water is, is, is problematic, especially with things like carbon-14. I'm not sure fully what the impact would be on uranium and potassium. Now, here's the thing, though. Volcanic activity, this is what the effect would be. Volcanic activity uh, would have originated in the flood because it's also where the continental drift took place. Uh, essentially, if you, if you crunch the numbers, you find that the, that the highest point on the Earth was under five miles of water. And so you have tremendous pressure on the crust. Now remember, the crust is relatively thin compared to the diameter of the Earth. Underneath the crust, you have more liquid. Okay, so you had huge quantities of liquid, a little bit of crust, and, and then liquid. Uh, that would have, and, and did, crack the crust. That's why you had the continental drift. It also would have put tremendous pressure underneath, what's underneath the um, the crust, so it would have been much more vis uh, fluid. And so um, you would have had a fairly rapid motion of continents at the time. And then, as the, you know, and also that the water also absorbed back into the ground. It started out, come to think of it, the flood started out with cracking of the ground, right? Because it wasn't just rain, it was also water coming out from, from the ground. And so you had two, so really it was, you know, it, it could be that the seismic events started right there at the beginning of the flood. I'm not really clear. But m most definitely by the end of the flood, you would have had massive seismic and volcanic eruptions taking place. And we can actually see that in like the ice cores where that took place because of the different, there's oxygen 18 and oxygen 16, two different types of oxygen, and you can see them in the ice cores and where the temperature changes took place in the water would have influenced, um, you know, the composition of the ice. And so we can see that as far as, uh, as far as carbon goes, yeah, it would have, I mean, carbon, carbon and water, are, you know, they, they hook up pretty well. You know, they just wash out of bicarbonate and things like that form. So yeah, it would have had a significant impact. 
Oh, no, that's not the kind of radiation I was referring to. Uh, like radioactivity, that type of radiation. Yeah. I don't know, but it's kind of thought provoking. I don't know how to answer you, but considering that Moses couldn't look at God and you certainly can't stand face to face with something that's seriously radioactive. I mean, who knows? I don't know. It's a cool thought. That the, the basic assumption of uh, radioactive dating, any of them, any of those dating processes, is um, a principle that's called. Um, the metal block is what it's called. <laughs> Somebody help me out here. Um, but the idea that, that you know, we look at a rate of process in, under current situations and we can project that rate of process back and the, 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 the present is the key to the past is the idea. Um, And, and so that, that principle that, that is used by evolutionists to, as, a, as a premise for uh, radiocarbon dating or, or potassium argon, any of these, is um, that these rates of process are relatively constant. Um, in fact, we know that uh, the rates are not constant. Uh, we have no real reason to assume that any of these rates would remain constant, for, especially over the course of billions of years. And um, you can also look at uh, other rates of process that under that same assumption would also, you know, you should be able to measure, for instance, uh, the level of uh, uh, sodium chloride salt in the ocean. We know the salts are uh, salts carried in solution by water into the oceans. The oceans uh, constantly evaporating water into the atmosphere, and things that don't evaporate are concentrating in the ocean. So you look at the rate at which salt is being added to the oceans, and you project that rate back into the past. You look at the, con the, the current level of s salt in the ocean, and you should be able to project or, or come up with a, uh, an estimate of the age of the oceans by that process. Um, and there's, there's scores of different natural processes that we can measure those rates for. Um, and if you look at all these different rates, we find estimates for the age of the Earth that range from uh, a few decades out to billions of years. And so there's no consistency ag across the whole array of different rates that can be used. Uh, therefore, you either have to toss out that system as a, as a way to come up with a valid estimate of ages, or you take the rates that give you the numbers you want and go with those because that's what you want the age of the earth to be. And the, 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 really the only options you've got. And one of the cool things, oh cool, one of the fun things that some creationists like to do is they like to uh, carbon date live things and they'll get like ridiculously old ages. I, I know of one case where they carbon dated a live clam and they'd say it was 3,000 years old. I mean, it's, you always get ridiculously long ages. I think I had that clam at a clam bake last <laughs> summer. <laughs> That's right. So, I mean, and it's not uncommon. It, that happens with, you know, once in a while you get somebody carbon dating live things and they just have a lot of fun with it. Yes, good evening, two gentlemen. Uh, we, had, uh, we have had this class here now going on this week and we have taken a very good and deep look at the apologetic method and 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 what are the merits of different different apologetical approaches and facts in the in in the doing of the apologetics i i just would like to hear just just a little bit perhaps uh, what do you think are the primary merits of this information that we have, like we have been presented here tonight, and also you could talk very long. Uh, uh, somebody who is who is specialized in this subject, like 
uh, like, uh, for example, Pastor Klika, I, I can imagine that you remember a lot of these things um, because you've been teaching these things and you can recall this and, 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 and it's, it's, very <laughs> it's very doubtful that, uh, and that uh, like, I, I don't have a good mind of remembering a lot of facts and recall them right on the spot and, and especially if I'm not a specialist in this thing, this is very superficial what I can present on the apologetic conversation when I'm, I'm soul winning and so on. But in your experience, what would be the merits? Like, in what sense this would be helpful to present and what would be the limitations? I'm not, I'm not entirely sure that I understand your question. You mean like what use is it? What do you use it for? That's a good question. <laughs> All the information uh, I gave you in 50 cents, I'll buy you a cup of coffee. Can I add something <laughs> But the questions? I think to put, to put back in context, I did say to the students during the week that when you don't feel comfortable with understanding an argument, don't use the arguments. The idea being is if you want to have a, um, an impact in, in, in discussing with people, you need to be sure that you know what you're talking about. And I think we we I we would agree we all had the impression after tonight that we don't qualify to talk about evolution. <laughs> after an hour and a half, I think I I heard I I mean in English is not my first language, but I think I I learned maybe 300 new words in an hour and a half, <clears throat> and that me, that puts me in a very uncomfortable position to say I'm qualified to say anything about this. I'm thinking now. I mean, if I meet someone who asks me someday about evolution, I would say, wait a minute, I have Pastor Klikas for number, can you talk to him? <laughs> so what Pastor Arto is saying is, um, <clears throat> I think this what you're saying in the context is that, okay, what can we, as maybe non-specialists, non what can we draw for what you guys say tonight, what you'll say tomorrow, and how can we, uh, as non-specialists, be efficient, and how can the material you're giving can be useful to somebody who is not good in, in evolution, right? Yeah, that would be. that's a that's a good question. Um, okay, <laughs> um, it's it's a little bit tricky to to answer that. Um, I completely agree with you. If you don't understand it, don't try to handle it. And there's no there, Here's the thing: there's no requirement for us to understand this. Right? If we understand it, great. If we don't understand it, who cares? Uh, even in soul winning, um, and I think, like I said at the beginning of, of the lecture, that there's really two things that this is useful for. To edify the body in their own faith, and sometimes to reassure them in their faith, because this can challenge people's faith. Science is, one of, I think, one of the biggest challenges that Christians have to their faith, although it's needless. Uh, there's no reason to have faith challenged because of science. The second thing is to win the lost. But we have to keep this in mind, is that we give the gospel and the Holy Spirit wins the lost. I can tell you about the biology of something until I can make my own head spin, but it will not help to win the lost. The Holy Spirit wins the lost. This is just one of the tools, okay? Uh, maybe it can help remove an obstacle, but the Holy Spirit is actually the one who's removing the obstacles. And so, you know, we have to understand, okay, you, you don't understand biology or you don't understand physics or whatever. It's, who cares? Uh, I've, never un I've never met a somebody get, who got saved because they understood that evolution didn't take place. I have met plenty of people who say they believe in evolution and then they had great discussions with me about the love of God. Right. And so, you know, that's what really wins the lost, is the gospel. And the Holy Spirit does the winning. Um, now, that being said, this does have a value, though. And it's not so much uh, as far as the lost goes. The value of this is that when science starts to affect our understanding of the Bible, then science has become an idol. And I think that a lot of Christians are in that place. That science is affecting their acceptance of the Bible and of the simple biblical truths. We want scientific explanations for what God said. 
And God says, I offer you none. It's like when they wanted evidence, right? When they wanted a sign, he said, the only sign you guys are getting is the sign of Jonah, right? He wasn't willing to do that. Why? Because God doesn't want us to walk by sight. And science is nothing more than a form of sight. He wants us to walk by faith. There are certain things that science will never explain. Try as it might, it will never explain it. Uh, and that's where we get in trouble because sometimes we try to explain things with science that are not explicable because science is too limited. And then when people insist on explaining, like say, six-day creation, there's so much debate about the six-day creation. Was it, uh, gap theory is another one. So much debate about gap theory. Uh, you know what? All, in, at least in my view, all it is is somebody caving wanting to accept something through scientific explanation that God says he wants us to accept on faith. There is one proof only that God offers, and that's Hebrews 11.1. 1. And there is no other proof in the Bible. Everything else can edify. Everything else can help, perhaps, in some understanding. But it cannot, it cannot become a substitute. And I think what happens to Christians is sometimes we try to use it as a substitute. If someone walked in this door tonight thinking, it's so difficult for me to soul win because somebody's going to ask me about, you know, how can you possibly believe that the earth is only 6,000 years old and God created everything all at one time? And they start talking about evolutionary theory and I can't defend myself then, you know, I just, if they're prevented from soul winning because of that fear they may have themselves, and what we say tonight and tomorrow night encourages them that, in fact, we have as sound a scientific basis for believing the biblical record to be true, at least as sound a scientific basis for that belief, and that, well, maybe I can face people when I go soul winning, then, then this class has had real value. Um. Yeah, um, so it's one of the things, uh, you know, I'm, I, have a, I have a master's degree in science, right? And really, I don't find it of that much value except in as much as it lines up with the Bible. I mean, I work in it. I work in science. You know, I'm a teacher, but... It's still, the only value it really has is where it lines up with the Bible, where it can edify. Uh, I mean, okay, if I'm a doctor, then science can have intrinsic value as far as helping heal somebody's body or something like that. I don't mean that kind of value. I mean of a personal sort. Um, this one thing I cannot emphasize enough, and I see it all the time is people saying the Bible can't be just simply right because scientifically it must be this way. I got news for you. The Bible's right. And whether somebody wants to add something to that or not, the Bible's still right. It says what it says. Science is a process of discovery in which most of our discoveries are proven wrong. Half of what we know in science today, in four years, we will know it's not so. And scientists accept that fact because it's simply part of the scientific process. We think we know something, we don't believe it anymore. I'll guarantee you in the next, if, if God doesn't come back, the rapture doesn't happen soon, then 50 years and Big Bang Theory will not be accepted that well anymore. It's, I mean, sci theories have a shelf life. Even now, evolutionary theory is coming under heavy fire from evolutionists. Right? Because the advent of molecular biology, where you can actually examine DNA, has turned everything on its head. We used to draw evolutionary relationships by similarities between organisms. And now we're finding, uh, based on DNA, that those similarities aren't all that similar. Now we think, and this one just makes me laugh, now we think that 
a cow is more related to a whale than a rat is to a mouse. Okay? That's completely turned things on its head because a cow and a whale are more genetically similar than a rat is to a mouse. But genetic similarity, we're finding out now, is actually kind of meaningless also. A genetic similarity is not the end all. And some scientists are actually questioning whether genetic similarity should even play all that big a role in evolutionary thinking. Um, what's that? Um, I'm not sure what you would like me to explain about it. What are those two animals? How do you know they're dogs? They look so different from each other. Well, what's a, what's a dog? Uh, is a dog a black and white spotted thing or a tan thing? Yeah. My color blindness coming out here, is it? Um, yes, you, I mean, the, in other words, yes, those two are dogs. But what defines what a dog is? And you could show that picture to a toddler, you know, a two-year-old. And that two-year-old would know those are both dogs, even though just looking at the picture, there's so very, very little that they have in common by appearance. Um, and that's the problem in defining what a species is, to a certain degree. Um, although the other way, the way Pastor Mike was explaining it during the lecture is the fact that those two dogs Physically speaking, probably almost impossible for the two of them to reproduce and, and create a viable offspring, especially if the chihuahua happens to be the female. Um, That's a bad day. <laughs> bad several months. Oh. I actually have two questions. One related to this. Uh, can you just explain a little bit the difference between this concept of species and the biblical concept of kind and like that determination and then I've got an, another question back to the ages or, or not necessarily ages but yeah kind is a much better word than species in my view uh, because kind doesn't carry the baggage that species carries Everything, and in biology, this is obviously a well-known thing. Everything reproduces after its kind. It's one of the fundamental principles. Everything reproduces after its type. The biologists would say type. Same as kind. In other words, the genetics determine the outcome, right? Genetics also determine the possibilities. Uh, so this is a big problem for, for the abortion crowd. Okay, they say, well, it's not a human until some point. Well... That's not true. If it's alive and it has the genetics of a human, it's, a, it's human. Okay, it can't become anything else. It's just a really small human. And so the kind is really talking about DNA. According to its DNA capacity, that's what's going to come out. In other words, the DNA defines the organism. Uh, the species, you would say the same thing, that the DNA would define the organism. But how do you then allow for evolution if the DNA defines the organism. Well, somewhere along the line, you necessitate something not reproducing after its kind. And that's a violation of, you know, basically biological law. And we know that we can get mutations, right? There's children are born with, with genetic illnesses. Okay, we know we can get mutations. But a mutation doesn't make up evolution. And that's one of the things that you know, has to be understood. And even that evolutionists overlook, that simply a mutation present in an offspring is not going to give you evolution. Number one, it has to be beneficial. Number two, it has to be sustainable. Most mutations, you cannot even begin to suggest are beneficial. Unless a mutation takes place in significant enough numbers, it's not sustainable. In other words, part of evolutionary process would require 
that a new trait that is introduced through the addition of new information into the DNA, um, that that trait be able to reproduce itself in the population and is sustained in the population. Keep in mind that evolution is supposed to be a population phenomenon. In other words, it doesn't happen in individuals, it happens in populations of individuals, groups of in individuals. If that trait does not occur in sufficient number, just the numbers game alone will eliminate that trait. And so you can say, okay, we, uh, you, we can introduce a trait through mutation. Okay, say that you do introduce a trait through mutation. Say that it even uh, or gives a, uh, a survival advantage. Okay? If you don't have enough of the organisms present in that population with that trait, even if it does give a survival advantage, that trait will die off. It's called genetic drift. And so part of it is a numbers game. You know, so, so the whole idea of kind and species are both extremely similar and extremely different. Okay, because in species we're really talking about evolutionary thought. A species is an evolutionary concept. It's not really a concept after, after biblical thought. Now, the way that Christians define species, they essentially define it as kind, a type, right? which is the biblical way of seeing it. And that's fine. But that, you know, we leave out the evolutionary baggage. All right, my uh, second question real quick is... Um, in all your studies, what has been the most, like the best argument that the, the evolutionist has presented to you? That from you, you know, maybe like just honest, like as a science, like from a scientific perspective, like it has been difficult for you to like think through or, or maybe there's none, but I'm, or. Um, I can uh, uh, and this isn't. Please don't misunderstand, but I haven't heard a good argument from an evolutionist. Um, the strongest thing that evolutionists have going for them is that microevolution happens. And the notion is because micro microevolution is demonstrable, macroevolution must be true. But that's that's an apples and oranges comparison. Um, I can't say that I've heard a strong argument from an evolutionist. I think evolutionist arguments are obviously faulty. With the, the your first question, the kind species thing actually fits in well with what Pastor Mike just said. Um, if you look at kind from a microevolutionary perspective, the kind would be that progenitor that God created, which could be segregated out through microevolution, through the reduction of traits in certain populations, the, the, the reduction in overall genetic material in certain populations, to eventually result in several different reproductively isolated um, populations, organisms. Um, and species in the, in the evolutionary sense, as Pastor Mike was just saying, would be uh, those things which have come into being by the addition of new material in unique lines which would be reproductively isolated. So it, reproductive isolation works in both of them, be it geographic isolation or behavioral isolation or, or uh, whatever. But Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, rattlesnake, boa constrictor, garter snake, water snake, all, you know, snakes are all snakes. And um, so, you know, there was even a Gary Larson cartoon that showed God at the table creating, and he's taking bits of clay and going like that. And making all these snakes and saying, "Gee, these are easy." You know, <laughs> um, but so we, you know, um, God created, and and other than Adam and Eve, 
um, there's no no numbers of individuals recorded in in the the Genesis account, but um, you know God, God created some snakes, and within however many snakes He created, there was a genome with the with the potential to form all these different species of snakes which we see today or maybe that you know maybe there were a couple of different kinds of snakes that he began with um, and and then through microevolution we see the array of species we have today um, and you know and those are you know they're, they're reptiles so there are other species that have an, or other, other kinds of organisms that have um, a host of very similar traits uh, and characteristics. Lizards, alligators, turtles, and so on. Um, but those are each different kinds, but kinds which are structurally very similar. Um, their their uh, phylogeny, their, or their ontogeny, rather, their um, Development from the zygote to the mature adult is has follows similar patterns as well. Um, but all of those are, again, through a microevolutionary process. In other words, the the genetic potential in the original kind was far greater than it is in any one individual type that we have uh, existing on the earth today. Whereas evolution starts us with an amoeba that has a very, very small, simple genome and then adds to it and adds to it and then diversifies it and ends up with this vast array. Uh, I know there was questions here, but it's almost time. You've been here for eight hours every day since the beginning of the week, so we want to finish on time. <clears throat> so thank you, Pastor Klicka, for taking the time to be here. We will have Pastor Norman tomorrow night. But that is great. So we have, if you have some other questions, maybe you can grab Pastor Klicka on the way and prevent him to go home. But he lives, you know, he, he has a busy schedule also. But, I mean, if you have a few minutes, if he wants to, he can. And uh, <clears throat> so we'll see you uh, tomorrow morning, 8.30, for the last day.